Hey guys, how you doing? It's uh, Key here from Kegland, and uh, looks like we are live and ready to go. So yeah, my name's Key from Kegland, and uh, basically, uh, yeah, I've been uh, working in this business uh, for quite some time. Um, I guess, uh, you know, taking us right back to the start, um, my uh, my love of home brewing came from originally when I started home brewing at university. So, um, you know, I was a university student, like where a lot of people start home brewing, I guess. And uh, I guess being an engineering student as well, uh, beer was sort of just part of the culture, I guess. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where I originally started home brewing because I think I just really wanted to make cheap, cheap beer. Uh, because, you know, beer is something that's uh, fairly well taxed in Australia and, uh, well, not as much as Norway and you guys are really copping it over there with your yeah, alcohol tax, I suppose. But it's definitely an area where you, when you're on a budget as a student, you want to save as much as you can. And then, um, you know, I sort of took a little bit of a break from home brewing uh, in my later life in university, but then started to take it up again when I had a little bit more money. And uh, when I had my second birth in home brewing, I really sort of wanted to uh, get in ho get into home brewing for different reasons. I sort of saw these ingredients starting to come out that we'd never seen, seen before and hops start to come out and all these new keg systems and that type of thing. And keg systems and stuff like that for domestic use really weren't popular, uh, you know, when I first started off. So, you know, being, uh, you know, right back at 2000 and sort of four or five when I got my first keg system, um, you know, you really had to, you know, search around, uh, you know, different sort of secondhand sites to try and buy stuff, old old taps from pubs and that type of thing, because there just wasn't uh, home brew stores that accommodated really well. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, when I first started off, we wanted to make all that keg dispensing stuff really accessible because I really loved it myself. I got into all this keg dispensing and, and jumped off bottling so early. Um, that I just wanted to share that with uh, other people and uh, everybody that came over and sort of saw it, they tasted it and like, oh, this is fantastic, love it. And it just sort of always seemed to taste better when it was off tap for some reason. And I just had a lot of success and enjoyment out of it. So um, yeah, it's kind of funny. When we first sort of begun the, uh, the, the business, it actually was called Keg King. We started this Keg King business back in 2006. And, um, you know, it was only this tiny little business on the side. And we actually started a business which was in automotive accessories, which is our main core business. So we made like things like roof racks and bike racks and uh, spent time designing that. And because I had a bit of a, uh, I guess, uh, another passion, which is the outdoors, making roof racks and bike racks and stuff like that was something that I uh, also really enjoyed. Um, but, uh, you know, my passion for home brewing sort of really sort of shone, shone through. And as people say, if you do something you, you enjoy, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's what it was for me, I guess. Um, you know, getting into home brewing and being able to design beer taps and, you know, home dispensing gear and stuff like that was was uh, enjoyable. I generally found myself in a lot of my spare time, you know, gravitating towards that and, you know, making a lot of gear, which I essentially wanted myself. And, and, and it hasn't even changed these days. So, um, yeah, the Keg King business built up for a good odd 10 years. And eventually we had some shareholder disputes and it became very, very hard to sort of move that forward. So we shifted across and uh, we started a business called Kegland uh, back in 2008, uh, 18, sorry. Uh, yeah, so back in uh, January 2018, we started that. And um, yeah, it was. Uh, it's been a. It's been a real whirlwind. Uh, the Kegland business has grown faster than we ever sort of expected. Being a business now only not even three years old, um, you know, it's grown to be now the uh, Australia's largest keg dispensing uh, sort of company for all the hardware. Um, we supply a lot of stuff in China and then ship it direct out of China to uh, other countries. And Old Breaking is one of our distributors, which uh, we obviously work very closely with and very privileged to. Um, you know, work with them because they, they do a really good job of supporting the gear overseas as well. So, um, yeah, it's certainly one of those things which, uh, you know, we really, really, really joy, enjoy. And we're very lucky to have such a, uh, a fantastic group of, of retailers over in the States. We've got More Beer, which, uh, you know, do a lot of stuff for us over there and, and often promoting our stuff at various uh, conferences and, and so forth. And then distributors in other parts of Asia and um, stuff like that. So I think, yeah, to have a hobby like this, uh, which I'm really lucky, but also really lucky to get into this type of stuff at such a um, in such a wave because that sort of has really helped the business too. So, you know, back when we started in 2006, 
you know, the whole industry was so tiny. It was really small and, and, and home brewing was really for just those few diehard groups. But now it's, it's really becoming one of these sort of mainstream hobbies. Um, and it's becoming something which uh, is it, it, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the hops that come out or a lot of the new yeast that come out, they're often used and experimented in the home brew space first. And it's really, uh, you know, one of those those things, it's very exciting to see some of the best beers be getting made and now coming from, from home brew rather than it just being, you know, cheap alcohol, which, uh, you know, it used to be when, when I first started, I guess. But anyway, like uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk about with you guys, all the new stuff, uh, and that's when David contacted me. He said, look, Key, we really want to hear about all the, this cool new stuff, and that's what customers want to uh, you know, hear you talk about as well because um, you know, we've got a reasonable uh, design and development team here. We've got myself, and there's also uh, another engineer just across. So obviously, he's not here right now because it's 2am, but yeah, he's Dom just across in the other office. Um, yeah, I have to excuse the offices as well. It's pretty ugly here. We're all separated by this plastic sheet because of these COVID times. So everyone's sort of in these sort of big, you know, oversized plastic bags, essentially, um, just so we're, yeah, we're socially distanced and stuff as much as possible. But um, yeah, uh, let's uh, get into it. Some of, the, uh, some of the most exciting things on the calendar are sort of the web connected devices, just like a lot of other, um, you know, white good manufacturers or a lot of other people ma making stuff at the moment. The internet of things is one of those areas which, um, uh, is really exciting because I think it will ease a lot of the burden of, uh, of home brewing. You know, when I first started, I remember always having to have had a little light globe sitting inside a fermenter and turned it on and off and then upgraded from that and got like a little thermostat from an air conditioning device and then just installed that in there. And so I remember all the hassles of home brewing, I guess, and it's definitely getting easier and easier. But um, one of the most exciting things about having everything starting to get connected through to the wrap portal, and that's, uh, um, that's sort of things like ferment fermentation temperatures and even gas control and, you know, to carbonate, to carbonate your beers and monitor the carbonation process. Um, uh, yes, yeah, separate temperature control boxes and also even the brewing process. Uh, so on the new Brazilla Gen 4s, uh, I don't want to talk too much about them because they're a little way off. Uh, as well, but um, yeah, all of them eventually will be connected via what we call uh, the internet hub or the web the web hub, which we'll call Wrapped uh, R A P T. So um, yeah, one of the first products that people have already started to see on the web page, though, I'll just sort of bring it up now. Is um, I'll just share my uh, screen here. Hopefully this works all right. I hope I don't run into too many issues here. I think you should be able to see my screen now. There we go. Um, so one of the first wrap products we're going to, going to release is this uh, fermentation chamber. Uh, I might just put it in this mode here, wireframe it. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is a product which a lot of people are actually already making themselves. We get a lot of customers who, uh, you know, want to control the fermentation process. And I'm, and I'm sure in a place like Norway, where a lot of you guys are listening right now, it's pretty chilly up there. And the need to heat a fermenter is definitely, definitely there. Um, probably not so much cooling, but definitely down here in Australia, we need to cool as well. So we wanted to make a product which did all heating and cooling. It logs up to the internet, which is why it's got this uh, sort of uh, the electronics up here. And this little screen on the front also, um, yeah, it will display a little graph in here and you can set temperature profiles and stuff like that. Um, it's the first time that somebody's actually made a fermentation chamber like this, I suppose. If you look at a lot of the fermentation uh, sort of controller devices that are out there at the moment, they're generally glycol chillers. And look, we sell them too. I mean, we sell glycol chillers too, like the G20, uh, and that's a great unit. But I personally, I guess, I've always had a bit of a thing against glycol chillers, I guess. I guess I've had experiences uh, myself which haven't always been that positive like connecting hoses and then disconnecting hoses and the glycol sort of leaks out on the floor sometimes a bit frustrating the other thing i really don't like about glycol chillers is how they um uh, how they tend to have very cold spot uh, right where the chiller is so we've got a chiller coil or you've got a partial jacket around a fermenter and this tends to be the case generally in a lot of the home brew stuff where you don't get quite as good insulation as a lot of the commercial gear so if you get a get big commercial tank so um, if you look at the uh, big stainless steel commercial tanks like this, uh, 
Um, yeah, these large, uh, you know, microbrewery type tanks, they've got a good 50 millimeter thick polyurethane insulated wall around the entire tank. So, you know, these types of tanks, you know, they're, they're very, very well insulated. And they've also got a jacket which covers, you know, virtually the entire liquid volume of the tank. So you end up getting really, really even temperature. One of the problems that I see a little bit with uh, with home brewing is people get conical tanks or, or other types of fermenters and they'll jam a coil in the top. And certainly that will get the liquid to a specific temperature and that'll work. But then you also generally have this other issue that you're going to get convection currents in there as well and then you can have um, that taking quite a long time for a lot of the yeast to settle out and that's definitely been my experience anyway uh, because you don't get as even temperature control because I don't have uh, you know you don't have small homebrew fermenters which are as well insulated that tends to be sometimes a problem and one of the easiest ways and cheapest ways to solve that on a homebrew scale is um, really to just put the entire fermenter inside a chamber I guess which is temperature controlled so this is the first uh, fridge which has been designed purpose-built as a turnkey solution to do that. Um, so when you look at the uh, at the front here, I'll just rip the door off like that. Uh, you can see that it's quite a tall uh, fridge, so you can actually whack shelving in here and then you know put kegs above or use it for use it as a keg fridge and have two layers of, uh, of stuff. We can put even two fermenters stacked above each other in there. Um, or it does fit even the large, you know, 60 litre, you know, Firmzilla all rounders or other large conicals, I think often will fit in here as well. Um, yeah, it, it can come uh, with other parts, uh, which are add-ons as well. So if you look at the top of the fridge, you can see we've got like um, this mini regulator, uh, which is integrated. I can sort of take you through them. I think actually we, we've, these are selling really fast in Australia, these mini regulators. We sell... Yeah, thousands of these now. Uh, we're actually sold out at the moment, I believe. Um, but I think old brigging actually is starting to get these mini regulators just land in the next uh, couple of couple of weeks, I believe. But I'll talk, talk more about them later as well because it's got a few changes there. But you can also fit blow ties in here too. So when you first get the fridge, it'll come with panels like this, like just blanking plates. And um, yeah, these can pop out and then you can put in stuff like this or you can put in stuff like a blow tie and then there's actually channels uh, already made for the gas line in here, uh, whether that's gas going in or gas coming out for the fermentation process or for the carbonation process. So yeah, if we click on this panel here, I'll just suppress this and you can see what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, so what happens is, uh, you know, if you want to uh, basically run a gas line in, you've got these PCO carbonation, like uh, PCO threads here. And this, you can put one of our red carbonation caps on the side. So you can run a gas line in or out. Um, and then this panel here is a fairly easy removable panel. Oops, so I'll just actually make this transparent like that. Yeah, so what happens is the gas line runs through here, runs through this device, uh, comes through the other hole into this sort of cavity here, and then up through here, and then runs down into the fridge. So it's kind of nice that you can get one of these fridges, I suppose, and not only have all the temperature logging and that type of stuff, but you've also got a real well thought out turnkey solution. And this is a product that we've been working on now for ages. It's actually been in the pipeline for about a year and a half. So we've certainly taken a lot of time to uh, make a lot of modifications and, and slowly bring this product to market because we wanted to you know, really use the product ourselves for quite a while before we brought it out, make sure we got all the bugs out and that type of thing. Um, yeah, so this is a really, really exciting product. So definitely the first of the wrapped uh, products will be this one. Um, but one of the whole ideas of using um, something like a, uh, actually I'll just quickly show you this too, I won't save that. Um, yeah, you can also see the same fridge on the website. I've got a few renders on the website here which look a bit nicer. Um, that's actually changed, it's actually already, it hasn't even been released yet, we've already done upgrades to these renders, but yeah, that's... That's how the gas can be going, can come into through the top of the fridge, or this is uh, this can be uh, dropped to the side and then come in the side of the fridge. Uh, as you can see, you can stack uh, kegs in there as well. Uh, of course, it's going to fit uh, things like the Firmzilla tanks in there. So that's the Firmzilla 55 you see in that particular shot right there. Um, and um, 
yeah, that's pretty much it. So th there'll be some customers out there who will actually prefer to use this as a kegerator as well, because for the floor footprint size, this will actually fit the highest number of kegs because it takes advantage of the height. Uh, this fits even more kegs in the same footprint than, uh, than you know, most kegerators will. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a really exciting product, but really one of the things which uh, makes it, it makes the whole wrapped uh, sort of system exciting is because it, it links with other stuff, I guess. Another product that we're working on at the moment is uh, hydrometers. Uh, so I know there are a few digital hydrometers out there and some of you guys might use things like the Tilt, for instance. Um, you know, we use the Tilt as well and definitely when it first came out, we started distributing that one through our website and started selling it. We did have a few kind of issues with it though and we felt like it just, I didn't really like how you have to go and buy another Wi-Fi uh, extender to make it connect to the internet. So really, unless you didn't have your phone right next to the tilt, you know, connecting it to the internet or whatever, or, or, or for it to log to, you know, it, I didn't feel that was that really well thought through. So, you know, I was a bit disappointed with the tilt, I guess. Uh, there was, wasn't another really good product from your part of the world called Brewbrain. We gave that one a go too. And um, that was a that was a great product. And we actually almost started working with the team, uh, the Brewbrain team on on, on, on the new wrapped uh, device. But our, our version, it looks like this. Um, it's sort of quite, a, a, it's a little bit different, but you know, similar in some respects. Uh, it's, it connects to Wi-Fi directly. Uh, one of the exciting things about the uh, this new pill hydrometer, we call it, well, we're going to call it a pill hydrometer because it looks like a pill, firstly. Uh, you can see that uh, we've got a join right in the middle of the device here. So uh, one thing about the some of the other ones, we found like when it has a cap on the end, like the tilt, it was quite not that ergonomical to get off. And sometimes if somebody over tightened it or, you know, it, it's hard to get enough torque on it sometimes, but uh, it didn't really come apart that easy. So we wanted to have a seam line in the middle. And because the seam line for the uh, injection mold is in the middle here, where we have the O-rings to separate it, um, you know, it does look a little bit like a pill, especially when they're going to be colored as well. So uh, this first, uh, these first samples that we got made out of the injection molded tooling, they were all made all clear. But uh, in the future, what we'll have is these pill hydrometers and one side will be colored. So it'll look really exactly like, like a pill you would, you know, you'd get, your, your doctor would prescribe to you. So um, yeah, uh, we're still looking for a name, I should say. So if you look, if you guys think of other better names for this new stuff that's about to come out, please just shoot us a message. We'd love to love to hear from you. Um, but this hydrometer, yeah, it does give off a Bluetooth, be Bluetooth beacon, but it also gives off a Wi-Fi signal as well. So it can, can connect directly to a router um, if you've got a good enough signal. But also it means that if you drop this inside the wrapped fridge, uh, the wrapped fridge can also pick up on the Bluetooth signal because obviously when you shut the door on one of these fermenters, the fridge, the fermentation cha chamber acts like a big Faraday cage and it blocks a lot of the signal. So uh, what we can do is um, have at least the Wi-Fi get to the controller, which is right on top of the fridge where the aerial is a little bit more exposed. Um, and that way this device can then talk to the wrapped fridge and that wrapped fridge can then essentially act like a repeater station grab that signal and then feed it back to your uh, your wi-fi router um, or if your wi-fi router just so happens to be close enough or it's in your garage or you've got a repeater then you might have a strong enough signal to get to this directly so it gives you sort of multiple options i guess by having these devices all talk to each other um, the other exciting thing about having these devices all talk to each other with this all this sort of Internet of Things uh, stuff that's coming out is we can have stuff which is, um, you know, a little bit smarter in the way it's designed uh, in the software as well. So typically, if you've got a fermentation profile, all the devices at this stage that I'm aware of, they allow you to really only control temperature over time. So basically, X number of days in the fermentation process you know, be this particular temperature, and then I'm going to raise the temperature, and then do that, and then drop it, drop to do a crash chill. That's you know more or less, this, you know, most of the most of the temperature profiles that you're going to make, and have that same type of format. The problem is it doesn't really take into account, um, you know, the gravity. But as soon as you've got the information from this going up to the web, and then the wrap tub also having information fed up to the web, these this type of integration enables us to make really smart decisions with the brewing process. So if we're using a, a new yeast uh, that we haven't used before, like I actually, I used this Vedant yeast, for instance, the other day from Lullamond, and I was like blown away by it. I actually love that yeast. I'm going to use a lot more of it in the future. Um, but Vedant was one of those yeast strains. It had 
quite an aggressive uh, ramp up. Uh, and, you know, it was really surprising. I didn't expect it to really take off that fast. And had I just plugged in a standard profile, it wouldn't have the smarts to say, yep, you know, this is how to ferment this beer out. But we can actually have logic in there, um, which will see the speed of which the beer is fermenting and not just uh, the terminal gravity as well. So we can have new profiles start to come out, which people can share with each other and stuff like that, which take into account, you know, the, the, the change of gravity over time uh, and temperature. So that way we can basically have those numbers come in and we can say, look, if the, if the, if the gravity is going up to this point, uh, you know, ferment at this temperature, if the gravity starts to slow down and is only uh, increasing by, you know, a few points, you know, in a, in a day, uh, then, you know, we know we're reaching the peak of what it can do. Uh, start going into diacetyl rest and then you know after that process is finished we can once again look at the gravity change over time and then we can start to action a, 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 a crash chill uh, you know based on based on that and have all the smarts in there for you so I think something like that will really ease the burden for a lot of new brewers as well because they'll just be able to go you just want to drop this in they don't even know need to know much about the yeast uh, and they can just sort of plug it in say what parameters they're doing what recipe they've got and bang and it just sort of of does it all for you so it's one of the uh, holy grails i guess in the whole process is try to make this uh, whole uh, home brewing experience more automated it's kind of funny in a lot of ways i think everyone in this industry we love the uh we love getting our hands dirty and getting into it making stuff from scratch but as soon as we master that we're like well how can we automate this process so it's sort of it's a very funny uh thing home brewing i think a lot of the it attracts a lot of uh people in the science industry, a lot of other engineers and that type of stuff because, um, you know, it's quite technical and the gear as well, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's, I think some people enjoy the gear almost as much as the brewing process itself or drinking the beer for that matter. Um, yeah, so there's that. There's also uh, this gas controller. This is something that none of you guys have heard about this. So this is sort of the first time we've spoken publicly about any gas controllers, but I'll show you some of the research that we're doing in this department. This is kind of cool. Uh, now, this is just the early days of prototyping, but I'll fire this up on the screen. Sorry, give me one second here. I'll see if I can do this. Uh, yep. Yeah, so this is a prototype device. So the, the finished product will not look like this in the end. Um, yeah, basically, this is just uh, basically machined out, but we've made up a little circuit board. It uses uh, actually a lot of the similar electronics that we've got in the fridge, to be honest with you. But this particular prototype, prototype device is one which we um, uh, have just been playing around with. Now, this one here, this actually controls the CO2. Well, it's it's on, on here, it's a CO2 metering device, and that's our primary thing that we're wanting to solve. A lot of people, when they get into kegging in particular, they have a lot of problem with carbonation, right? So a lot of our new customers, it's almost one of the most common phone calls we get is like, key, I've overcarbonated my beer, or I've undercarbonated the beer, I don't know what's going on, or having all these issues, or it was undercarbonated and now I've overcarbonated it. And people set the wrong dispense pressure, or um, you know, they use the shake method, the forced carbonation method, and shake the keg to bits and have a lot of problems that way. Um, but uh, And people uh, are getting more and more impatient these days and want to carbonate really fast, but then don't want to overcarbonate as well. So we primarily made this device originally for carbonating kegs. Uh, I know there are other devices like the Blickman uh, Quick Carb and that type of thing, and I I'm sure they work pretty well. Um, but uh, one of the things that we didn't like is how some of the other carbonation devices require either some type of stone that you immerse in the liquid, it's another thing to sanitize and stones tend to clog up or like things like the Blickman quick carb, which actually recirculate the beer itself. We thought oh, it's not, I didn't really love it because then, it, you know, you would, you would have uh, more chance of, uh, there's more stuff to wash out firstly. So you got all that extra gear and the pump and stuff like that. You have to sanitize and all that palaver, just making the whole process uh, more complicated. Um, and although it sped the, carbonation process up you know it, I felt it wasn't really a very elegant solution so what we uh, wanted to do was have a device which actually could volumetrically measure gas flow now this was a difficult thing to do because like you know we've got a whole lot of uh, other sensors out there which can do an accurate job but 
they cost like four or five hundred bucks. So like, you know, we first set out to, to try to achieve this and we looked around for sensors and like, how are we going to measure volumetrically the gas flow? And then we couldn't find a lot of devices under the, you know, in the price range, which was accessible to you guys. So um, yeah, we found uh, ones from Honeywell and there was also Siemens, uh, you know, controllers and, and they use like capacitive sensors in some of them and some of them use some more complicated mechanical moving devices as well to measure the gas flow. And even with those expensive ones, they didn't actually measure gas flow uh, at a very uh, low flow rate. So that's actually one of the issues. So if you left you just keg carbonating uh, slowly and you didn't want to shake it or elevate the temperature too much, um, yeah, it was very, very hard to measure gas flow. So, or if you had a small amount of beer, maybe you've only got 10 litres of beer and you're carbonating, it's only a very small trickle of gas that was coming in to carbonate that keg. So that was something that we wanted to solve all these problems with something which you could just have the sitting in between your regulator and your keg and the gas could flow across into the keg and then once a certain amount of gas been delivered this device will turn off a solenoid valve and then you say yep that's enough gas keg is carbonated job done send alert to your phone and say beer is carbonated so that's sort of something which is really exciting the prototypes have already started to work and we've got within about sort of seven or eight percent accuracy with the carbonation level. But, you know, with the next injection molded housing that we've got, where we basically will have a, uh, a more accurate metering chamber and stuff like that, um, we'll, we'll have, I think, something, it should be even better than five percent. So it'll be a really, a really, really useful device, I think. But once again, like this device, it started off as a device which could be used to carbonate beer kegs and stuff like that. But it can also be used once we've made the new uh, sort of injection molded housing and stuff like that, be used for monitoring gas out of the fermentation process too. So uh, what we can do is, um, you know, have this hooked onto a pressurizable fermenter, for instance, and then that way, um, you know, we can actually meter how much gas is coming out and then essentially we know where we are in the fermentation process, even without potentially dropping a hydro, like one of these, uh, one of these, these hydrometer, you know, things in there at all. So uh, yeah, another really exciting device uh, on the horizon and that'll be sort of wrap compatible straight from the, straight from the get go. Um, yeah, so uh, that's sort of uh, most of the wrap stuff for the immediate future coming out that's uh, on the horizon. Oh, and also temp control boxes as well. I've actually got this one here for David. Uh, you know, David's actually uh, um, a really good person for us to work with over in Norway because we can use him like a guinea pig for all our test stuff. So um, yeah, there's actually a little temperature. We actually just laser cut this one. It's not going to look like this at all, but um, you know, with the, the wrapped fridges, we wanted to make sure that electronics were just as available for people who didn't have the budget to buy the whole turnkey fridge solution. So we thought we better just sell the controller essentially in a box, like a little bit like some of you guys might might have seen like Inkbird temp controllers and that type of stuff. And I guess this is a little bit like an Inkbird controller, but a little bit more feature packed, I guess, and customized specifically for home brewing and has a screen on the front. So you can actually see the screen there. I'm not sure if the, the screens never really show that well. I hope it's not flickering too much on the camera there. So it has your temperature probe you just jam into the um, uh, into the fermenter uh, because it also has a i2c plug on board uh, yeah it's quite likely that eventually you know we we'll have like humidity controller and stuff like that humidity control abilities and stuff like that as well and then on the temp control box it won't have plugs that look like this it'll have separate types of plugs which will which will come out the bottom of the uh, bottom of the box, but the injection molds for these new temp controller boxes are just getting finished off now. And um, shortly after the wrapped fridges or fermentation chambers are released, these temp it will have new temp control boxes, which also will come out. Um, yeah, shortly after that as well, with all the same functionality. So they work as a repeater station, for instance. They have um, you know the same logging facility. So literally, you'll be able to get all the, all those benefits in in another another more portable uh, small device too. Um, yeah, Nuka taps are a big one. Obviously, that's something that's already been released. Um, so this is another one uh, which I've been really excited to uh, excited to launch. Uh, we launched this in Australia uh, only a number of months ago, and um, yeah, I guess you know we had been selling the intertaps for so long, and the intertaps became so popular around the world. Um, you know, it was such a difficult sort of bar to meet when we came out with a new uh, tap like the Nuka tap. 
it was one of these taps which, um, you know, which I think a lot of people felt, uh, why do you even need it? Like uh, they've had such a good experience with the intertap taps that they felt that they, uh, they they didn't they didn't see that there was a need for a new tap. But I personally have always been uh, someone who's always just even looking for small edges that we can gain uh, and increments that we can improve on. And and some parts of the old uh, intertap tap I didn't really like. Firstly. Uh, the way the body was designed, it was a little bit thick in some of the cross sections of the tap body, making it sort of heavy um, and also increasing the thermal mass of the tap. Uh, and that was one of the areas which we really set out to achieve and improve with the Nuka tap. So, yeah, with these new Nuka taps, we, we went out there and uh, we made this new tap um, with uh, a thinner cross section, but it really started a lot earlier than that when we were looking at the whole casting process and how the tap bodies were cast to see if how we can uh, basically make the casting on the walls more efficient because, you know, there was a lot of bulky amount of stainless steel in the casting because we couldn't get um, uh, as dense a casting, so the porosity we needed to improve. And then also, uh, you know, if we improve the accuracy of the casting, it means then we can machine tighter tolerances and we can have, uh, you know, thinner sections on casting. And that's often quite difficult to do. So we had to go back and then uh, work with the guys who do a lot of casting for us. We don't do casting ourselves. Casting's quite an involved process. So um, a lot of tap manufacturers outsource that process and go to a specific casting supplier. So we started working with that supplier uh, in uh, sort of early 2018 and then um, you know we sort of did a lot of work to try to improve the tooling um, so we could make the castings a lot more accurate so then we can machine with um, you know uh, much tighter uh, thicknesses and stuff much uh, smaller thicknesses and stuff like that and that enabled us to get the tap weight down which has made a significant difference in the what we call first pour foam. I guess when you're making beer taps, which are largely used in the home brewing market, you know every single uh, time you go to that font, it's it's most likely that the tap hasn't poured a beer for a while, and um, it's one of those things. It's pretty frustrating when you when you go to a a big bulky beer tap and you pour a, a glass of beer and you know you get half a cup of foam or sometimes even more than half a cup of foam and that adds to beer wastage and it's sort of like you know one of my pet hates I hate the sort of wasting uh, resources uh, where we don't need to so um, yeah it's something that we really wanted to yeah yeah ch change and we definitely have done that so um, yeah the Nuka taps have now been out for a little while and we've got some uh, pretty cool variations of those already so um, yeah we started to bring out these in the stainless steel finish first. I'll just actually bring some of this because some of these new products I think are going to be coming out in Europe pretty soon. Um, let me just change back to this mode here where you can see my screen. So obviously it was the uh, stainless steel finish first. And uh, yeah, then we started to do these, uh, these black ones as well, which we call the Stealth Bomber. Um, so yeah, it was actually quite surprising we brought just a few of these stealth bombers into australia and people have gone berserk over them so yeah people really like the the black look i guess and now we've got black uh, fonts and uh you know black spouts and uh even um even shanks like uh you know we have like at the moment like the shanks on the oop, don't have one right at my desk here now yeah we have even the shanks like that that little collar bit uh which sits on this threaded piece at the back of the tap here that was still chrome plated so now we've even started to make black shanks as well so the entire font and tap can be black i still personally prefer the chrome plated ones myself i must say but you know, I think there's some people just want that matte black uh, look and, you know, they've they've just sort of come out and I think uh, should be arriving in Europe pretty soon. Um, another really exciting product uh, that uh, we've been working on with the Nuka Taps is the Nuka, Nuka Tap Flow Controls too. So this is something which um, was another area I felt needed quite a lot of work because... Out in industry, we see a lot of flow control taps. Whoopsie, there we go. Just sort of pulling up the CAD here for you. Um, actually, maybe I'll switch over to my camera. Yeah, so if you look at a lot of the other, other flow control taps uh, that are out there, a lot of them are designed in a very similar way. So they've got like a... Um, 
uh, a lever on the side here which moves back and forth and generally speaking they're designed in such a way that you've got a flow control mechanism like this so this is actually a Perlick uh, flow control tap we used to sell some of these uh, Perlick taps uh, a while ago we haven't sold them for a while now but you know this particular design ooh, sorry uh, yeah, this particular design uh, is one that you see out there a bit and it does create quite a lot of foaming this design because you've got the, the flow path essentially with this type of tap uh, it comes in from this side from the shank goes around this part and then if you look at the flow control device here what it does is it flows across this surface here so I'm just going to texture out here. So it flows across this surface, uh, you know, here, right? So basically we've got this sort of black surface here that I'm colouring in here. Um, and it's a very small uh, flow resistive surface. So it's not a great amount of surface area to absorb a lot of uh, uh, flow speed. So yeah, we do find with some of the flow control taps like the old Intertap FCs or even these Perlick ones, um, yeah, where this wasn't really sufficient to absorb lots of uh, flow resistance. So if we had, um, you know, a keg system with extremely short beer line or large gauge beer line, it wasn't really that successful. We still had to absorb at least 50% or so of the flow resistance in the beer line length. And it kind of defeated the purpose of a flow control tap where it should be all taken up in the in the flow control mechanism, I suppose. The other, other thing you notice with some other flow control devices like this is it has some pretty nasty flow path on here, which causes a lot of foaming. So, um, you know, you can see in this particular design, we've got these cross drilled holes on the flow control uh, part of the device. So the beer has to go like this, enter from the back of the tap, go around the flow control device, then go through these uh, arrangement of uh, radial holes around the surface here. And these are just cross drill holes straight and stainless. There's nothing smooth about them at all. And right after it's gone through the flow control and the pressure's already dropped, and this is the risky part with a lot of beer, because as soon as you drop that pressure and it's just about to come out of the spout, this is when beer is particularly susceptible to the CO2 coming out of solution. But anyway, it drops through these fairly sharp drilled holes and you end up with some high and low pressure uh, points on this particular design. So when we did the analysis on this design, it didn't actually, well, not surprisingly, it didn't actually shape up that well. And this is really the reason why, um, yeah, some of the other flow control taps do pour with a bit of foam, which have uh, this type of design in there. So that was something which uh, we really, really wanted to change. The other thing that we wanted to change as well with flow control taps is Firstly, we wanted to make sure that we made a forward sealing one. That goes without saying. I should should have said that right at the start because um, you know if you're using old rear sealing taps, to be honest with you, you should just throw those things out and, uh, and and change over to a forward sealing tap. But the other thing is, yeah, with flow control taps, we wanted to make sure that we allowed for a spring return because a lot of the home brewers that we deal with, they want to be able to pull a tap handle and then let go of that tap handle and the tap handle to automatically turn off. Now, you know, in a lot of, uh, you know, fast turnover pubs or bars, it may be not that necessary to do so. And some people actually prefer to have the tap stay open. So if you're filling, you know, a lot of jugs and you just want to turn the tap on and have the jug sit there and you can go away and get the glassware while that jug's filling up, obviously, you know, yeah, in a, in a fast, turning, fast turnover bar, you know, it's not that desirable. But for a lot of home brewers, on the other hand, where, you know, you're probably getting you're probably getting pretty sourced yourself and you may not accidentally turn the tap all the way off completely, you can end up with an entire keg on the floor and a bottle of gas which runs out. So that's pretty annoying. So I think a spring return feature is, uh, is a really great feature. But these other types of flow control devices, it is... It's honestly, it's impossible to actually fit it in. You can't put the spring on the uh, in front of where the ceiling face is uh, because there's no space there. And because it's a forward ceiling tap, it would cease to be a forward forward ceiling tap. We're putting mechanical components on the on the dry end. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, due to the the, the 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 this part being a, a solid part with no uh, hole through the middle of it, it's very hard to fit the spring in place. So we knew that there was a need to make a whole new uh, you know, flow control mechanism which actually allowed and solved a lot of these problems. And that's where the Nucatap FC has, uh, has uh, that's the reason why the Nucatap FC has come out. So just like with the standard Nucatap, 
Uh, we did a lot of uh, flow dynamics uh, on this type of uh, tap to make sure that when the beer flows through it, we didn't have high and low pressure points. Uh, and this really allowed us to get a very laminar flow uh, when the beer came out the other end and uh, minimize the amount of beer wastage we have in foaming as well. Uh, the other thing is, I might actually switch across to the... Actually, I'll take the tap apart first so you can see inside. I'll take this flow control lever off. Look, the flow control levers are all pretty much the same. They use a detented little knob here, and the detented knob uh, just adjusts the flow mechanism. Uh, in the back of the tap, uh, we use actually this uh, this piece here. Whoopsie. Um, this little piece here. And this is a hard uh, piece of uh, plastic here. We actually make this out of polyketone. Uh, so polyketones are a really awesome plastic. I'm actually also quite excited. I, I actually love uh, polymers and plastics. I must say it's one of my interests. I spend a lot of time playing around with different plastics and injection molding new plastics and that type of thing. But um, this particular shuttle um, on the back, this is the uh, cone shaped device here. And we've got kind of like a star. I don't sure if you can see the hole through there, but it's sort of it's shaped a bit like a star flow pattern. And when we did a lot of our flow analysis, this particular shape actually is, is what allowed us the most flow dynamic uh, flow control device. Uh, but unlike a lot of the other taps like this one, this particular flow control device has the male piece stays fixed. And the other nice thing about this particular design, it drops into the back of the tap like this, so it acts as the seal between the tap body and the shank as well. So typically when you look at other you know, taps like the Nuka tap here, you'll have this O-ring seal which is in place. And essentially it's a dual purpose device. It acts like the seal itself, plus it acts like the, uh, uh, it acts like the, the, the flow control mechanism. And the other half of the flow control mechanism, I'll just pull out of the tap so you can see that here. Yes, this is the other part of the flow control mechanism. So um, these two parts here, um, this one sits down the bore of the tap, and this is just like a hollow sleeve. So this is just a, well, it's a little bit like a hollow sleeve. It's got a tapered end at one side. So this nests uh, inside this cone here like that, and that, those two nesting parts come together like so. Um, and then these two parts fit into the back of the tap like so. So, yeah, I'll just jump over to the uh, uh, other display here. Yeah, so I'll put a cross-section up. So hopefully you guys can see this. I've got a cross-section view. Now, this is a new design which we have just lodged all the patents for. So, um, yeah, with this particular design, this is the ceiling mechanism and flow control device, sort of two in one, sitting on the, the back shank side of the tap here. And then what you've got is this sleeve. And as you can see, this sleeve is what's moving back and forth. So when you move that detented arm on the side, so this little arm adjuster on the side here, this sleeve is actually what's moving forward uh, yeah, and as you can see, because it's a hollow sleeve which is moving back and forth, it gives us the ability to put a spring inside um, the tap bore. And that is one of the major features which we're trying to achieve as well. So, um, yeah, with this uh, spring sitting here, that sits up against the back of the shuttle. So, yeah, we retain that spring return function. Um, you know, it's very, very laminar flow through the star shape. So these, through this, the, these star shape holes um, through the back of this device here. And then also, once again, laminar, very, very laminar flow over the uh, shuttle itself. So this sort of uh, bullet or bomb shaped uh, shuttle, I guess, um, before the tap comes out. And we noticed significant benefits in this so far and all the testing that we've got. Uh, this tap really outperforms any other flow control tap that we've ever used. Um, yeah, so that's something which is uh, quite exciting. Up until uh, sort of this tap, I've always had like a bit of a, a skepticism for flow control taps and if they're necessary. Um, but I suppose this is sort of, this tap design is now starting to, to win me over to some degree. We have another product called a flow control ball lock disconnect, which actually fits on the keg post. And I still think that that is my absolute favorite for flow control. But, um, you know, if you really want flow control right at the tap end, I think this new, uh, you know, Nuka tap FC, it's really, really hard to beat. 
Um, so yeah, very excited about, get, about getting those over to Europe. We only have these starting to get sold now in Australia and these new F flow control um, uh, taps, I think should probably arrive to Europe in the next few months and uh, you should start to see them pop up. But look, if you've got any other questions or feedback on, on stuff like this, especially this new gear, always you know, shoot us an email. We'd love to hear what our customers have to say. You know, A lot of the great new products that we make, it actually comes from guys like yourself sharing information and your own experiences of, of using the gear as well. So we'd really love to hear from you guys uh, wherever we can. Um, yeah, another uh, sort of area of products that we do a lot of development uh, as well is keg kegerators. So, um, you know, as you know, we, we brought out the Series uh, X uh, not that long ago. Um, and uh, this was uh, quite, a, uh, quite an exciting product because up until when we brought the Series X out, we had the Series 4 model. And the 4 model was uh, the design which we had for oh, maybe like seven or eight years being sold. So it was well and truly due for an upgrade. We had that kegerator, you know, uh, for quite a long time. And we still sell the Series 4 now. It is a little bit cheaper. So we still sell the Series 4. But look, 90% of our sales now is in these new Series X models. And I suppose if you look at the energy consumption alone, that's sort of, um, you know, the, one of the best reasons to buy the Series X because this Series X fridge, it's significantly more energy efficient than, um, uh, than, uh, than the old Series 4 was, uh, saving something in the vicinity of, I think, about, uh, we measured about 15% more energy efficient, but... Actually, uh, it says 10% here, but actually I know that the it was even better than that. I think we've been quite conservative on our own web page here. Oh, whoops, sorry. I'll just go to this here. Yeah, so the Series X here. Um, and yeah, when we first made this fridge, it was the first small format kegerator like this where we were able to fit four uh, corny kegs. And one of the main ways we were able to achieve that is by modifying the internal hump in the fridge. So you can see at the back of the fridge, most fridges out there, or pretty much any other fridge that we've ever seen out, out there, and any other kegerator has always had a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, let's just have a look at this. Uh, yeah, it's always had a, a hump on the back for a compressor in one corner. But with the center configuration, it meant that we were able to put a keg on the left and right hand side of the compressor hump. And that just sort of, when we sort of shuffled around the kegs in all different configurations, that sort of worked absolutely the best for the, you know, tall, skinny, corny keg. So I guess it was the first uh kegerator built specifically for corny kegs in the 20 liter or 19 liter five gallon you know corny kegs i guess so um yeah that's one of the major reasons why this has been so popular the keg holding capacity and also the energy efficiency and power of it but this has been a really really popular model of kegerator and this size of kegerator i think will always be our most popular model but we noticed that there was a big jump in the range, especially in price between these types of uh, kegerators and also our Grand Deluxe ones. So if you look on our webpage, uh, if you want to buy a bigger kegerator than this and want to get uh, more kegs into your home bar, uh, really the only other option you would have is to get something like one of these Grand Deluxes. And these are quite big. So the next step up from that kegerator is this 12 keg model. Um, and this is quite a massive jump in price. It's like, you know, three or four times the price once you include all the taps and stuff like that. So it's really much, much more expensive. Like these types of kegerators are really designed for commercial use. And they're fully lined with stainless steel and they've got big, uh, you know, uh, condenser fans here. And they've also got quite a lot of uh, other mechanical components. They're, they're sort of more, I guess, uh, uh, complicated um, in the way that they're, they're built. And they're a bit more noisy as well. So I don't really see these as being so suitable for domestic use. And because there was such a big price jump in between like this Series X and this Grand Deluxe, we felt that there was a real need for us to jump in between and make sure that there was a model which sort of bridged that gap. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I've started to work on what we call the Series X Plus. So the Series X Plus is a new fridge which actually can fit eight kegs. So this one is... 
because it uses a similar manufacturing method to the Series X. So if you look at the Grand Deluxe, this is a completely different manufacturing method, right? So we're using the internal of the fridge is all folded sheet metal. Uh, so there's a lot of work in folded sheet metal and stuff like that. With this uh, thick type of steel frame and steel body, you end up with a lot more heat leakage through the side walls. And, you know, honestly, there's a lot of heat leakage through the glass doors as well, I'll say. Um, so that sort of reduces the energy efficiency. But most of our commercial customers that buy these, look, they don't really care about saving power. Um, but most of our domestic customers, on the other hand, do. So, yeah, we felt there was a need to use the same manufacturing methods like the Series X to make a wider format, larger kegerator as well, which is, yeah, you know, what we've done here. So this is what the Series X Plus looks like. Uh, yeah, if once again, if you're using standard corny kegs, you can fit eight in there. Or if you're using the large 50-litre kegs, you can fit two in there, for instance. I'll just take off the door so you can get a better look inside what it looks like. So I'll just suppress that part there. Oops, that's not the entire door. One second, I might do this. And I'll suppress that as well. There we go. So now you can see inside, it's got two uh, font holes and uh, you know you can fit two quad fonts. We're also making a whole range of new uh, fonts as well. We've got some new punched fonts as well, which, are, which will be a very price efficient way to make modular design fonts as well. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a product which you could use for fermenting too. So the temperature display on the front, you can set anywhere between um, negative five degrees up to positive uh, 28 degrees. So yeah, it doesn't heat, I should say, but it'll only cool in that heat in that range. But some people, just like the Series X, have been using our Series Xs for fermentation and definitely can do the same thing with this too. We did get some people request this connect to the wrapped hub as well, but we didn't quite see the need because it's not often that you're changing the beer dispensing temperature. Most people are sort of leaving it the same all the time. And, you know, the smarts that go with the wrapped hub weren't really as necessary. There's a good chance we might have some wrap connected um, flow control devices for the beer flow. So you can meter how much you've got left in the keg itself. But, yeah, not in the kegerator, uh, in, not in the kegerator body. But yeah, this is another really exciting product because this is a kegerator which will be only a, only like a couple hundred dollars more expensive. Oh, it's, I'm talking Australian dollars here. So um, what's that? I think 200 bucks or something like that Australian works out to be, um, I think, uh, about 6,000 uh, krona. Uh, Norwegian Krona more expensive than a Series X does. So, you know, this is a really, really exciting product. And it means that a lot of guys out there who had to make their own keezers now don't really have to. We get a lot of new customers that sort of come to us and they sort of, um, you know, they want to fit like, you know, seven or eight kegs in something and they're forced down the avenue because the Grand Lux is so expensive. They're forced down the avenue of having to buy a, a keezer or a, a chest freezer and then putting that wooden collar around and stuff like that. But, you know, keezers aren't really the perfect product, in my opinion. Having to lift the keg over the edge of the fridge is not that ergonomic. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, you know, having to clear the entire top of the fridge. I'm not sure what your bar's like, but as soon as I get a flat spot at my house to put something down like a glass or something, you know, it, it just gets covered with junk. And then, uh, you know, I find keys is the problem with every time you're like, oh, geez, I just got to disconnect that keg and switch a keg over. You got to clear everything off and empty the drip tray and take everything off the keys there. And that's always a bit of a frustration. So I think this is a product which will be great for those people who, you know, wanted to ha wanted to make a bigger home, you know, keg dispenser, couldn't afford a Grand Deluxe or don't want to spend the money in that type of product or don't want to have all the noise, uh, you know, or, or energy consumption of that type of product and want to have a really energy efficient uh, unit which uh, essentially fits, uh, you know, heaps of beer in there. So uh, this, is, this is something which will be released in Australia, I think sometime uh, towards the end of this year. I'm hoping that we can get this to market uh, for the Christmas rush. So this is something that we're aggressively pushing uh, and I think it'll arrive probably towards the end of November. Um, but when it's not just about really large kegerators, we've also got small kegerators as well we're working on too. So 
Um, you know, this is something that, you know, talking to a lot of our European customers, it actually, the small kegerators seem to be even more exciting to you guys. Because I know, uh, I think a lot of our European customers are doing, um, you know, smaller batches. And I think probably the house size in a lot of the European countries is a bit smaller than the house size in Australia or America, where we sell a lot of gear. Um, so one thing that uh, we've also got in the pipeline, this is kind of exciting because this is actually stuff that We've never shown anybody else these small kegerator designs either, so you guys are really kind of kind of privileged, I'll say. Um, but I'm going to bring up this here, which is um, yeah. Look, we haven't got a good name for these; they're just called mini mini kegerators at this stage. So if you guys think of some cool names, please um, please let us know. But I'm going to bring up this here. Yeah, here we go. So, uh, yeah, we've got these small kegerators, which are benchtop kegerators. And these are, uh, firstly, I want to say they're different to some of the other things that you've seen. Like if you've ever looked at, uh, sorry, I'll just make sure I've got the, yeah, I've got the screen share on there. Um, okay, I'm just pulling up some other images on the side here. So, this benchtop kegerator um, is one which basically fits two eight litre kegs in. And this is perfect for someone who, you know, maybe lives in a bit of a tight apartment or something like that, but still wants to have that enjoyment of having beer on tap at home. Um, it's made to be uh, not so wide and also fits these new eight litre kegs that we've got inside the fridge. I hope you guys can get a good, I'll try to zoom in a bit because I think like sometimes on these uh, on these live webinars, the resolution's not that good. So I'll zoom, zoom in really close. So yeah, you set the temperature on the front. Now this is very early days. This product probably won't come out until next year. So, uh, and I reckon probably towards the end of next year, realistically. Um, but you can see how we've got like, uh, yeah, standard two tap on the front there. Um, uh, the reason why I wanted to especially go with two tap on this is because we felt like it would be easier if we also had a carbonation and soda water dispenser. Like I love drinking carbonated water. To be honest, I don't even drink, I rarely drink flat water these days. I just sort of really enjoy uh, cold carbonated water. I find there's nothing more refreshing. Well, Nothing more more refreshing other than a beer itself, um, but yeah, than having a uh, having a, a cold glass of soda water. And I have used soda streams in the past, but that frustration of filling up the soda stream bottle and you know you're constantly putting those little bottles in the fridge and they take a while to chill down. And then it's just I don't know, it's just I find the whole thing a bit of a hassle. Uh, so really having soda water plumbed in is you know such an enjoyment. It's such such a nice luxury at home to be able to have soda water you know, on tap as well. So we felt that one of the easy ways or one of the easiest ways for a lot of guys to get a keg dispensing system over the line with the misses is if they also were able to put soda water on tap as well, because then they can sort of say, oh, look, you know, it's a soda water dispenser, but it also does beer on the side too. So yeah, it's one of those things that we wanted to make sure we had two taps so we could do that. Of course, you can put two tap, two beer taps, uh, you know, uh, on here and just have beer on in it. But yeah, we've got uh, these kegs showing at the moment in this particular render that you can swap one of the kegs out with a carbonation reactor and then plumb mains uh, water in there and then it carbonates inside this bench top dispenser. So it can be um, for chilled water and for carbonated water if you want to use both tap taps for that or it can have beer and, and soda water for instance or you can have just two beer taps or a beer and a cocktail or or you might even use it for uh, something like uh, nitro cold brew or something like that, for instance. But let's have a closer look at this one in the CAD because it's sort of easier to explain. These are nice renders and stuff like that, but really to understand the concept, I've got to pull up the I've got to pull up the CAD here. Um, yeah, so if you see this here, yeah, it's it's a very unusual fridge design. There's really no other benchtop fridges uh, that are like this. We did we did sample a lot of fridges in this process before we got to this stage. Like we tried buying things like um, you know I'm not sure if you've seen this one called the Krupp's Beer Sub. You know we actually tried this. I don't know if this is. I think this is made by some large white goods manufacturer. I think maybe uh, might be. 
uh, LG or something. Out oh no, Krups. Krups actually make this. Sorry, yeah. So we actually tried this thing first, and this uses thermoelectric chilling. And we did try to make thermoelectric cooling work. Uh, look, if, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, just go Google thermoelectric. But thermoelectric is sort of like a cheap alternative to using a proper compressor. But it means that um, it's not that electrically efficient and it chews a lot of power. So we felt that this, like when we we're doing a lot of testing in a lot of the other home dispensers like this, we had the problem that like we actually really wanted to, one of these solutions to work well for home brewing too. When we first started testing stuff like this, um, you know, we wanted to see if there was some type of little dispenser which you could put, you know, mini kegs into and dispense those mini kegs and then, um, you know, refill those mini kegs yourself and wash them out and stuff like that. But really, you know, the other ones on the market, all these mini systems, they just, they honestly, they just did not suit homebrew and they just took so much rework making a device like this suit homebrew that we just had to wipe the slate clean and make a whole new uh, mini kegger at a fridge design ourselves. Um, yeah, so that was sort of a bit frustrating um, because we knew that there'd be a much longer lead time getting a product to market starting from scratch. But you know, at the, at the long in the long run, it would be a much better product uniquely designed for home brewers. Um, the other problem though is with thermoelectric, these two are crap load of power. So I'm not sure if you've ever owned one of these or tried one of these, but if you get a uh, power meter, we put this product uh, uh, on a volt. Uh, 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 a power logger, which logs how much power consumption there was. And this Krups thermoelectric chiller actually used more power than our large Series X does. So that fits eight 20 litre kegs, and this little Krups one only fitted like three litre kegs. So, you know, we, it really highlighted the need for us to, you know, go to a proper compressor design as well. So, you know, in the design that we have here, you know, under the hood, we've got a proper uh, fridge compressor, meaning it will chill really efficiently, electrically efficiently, and then even on blistering hot days, you'll still be able to chill down beer, you know, really, really cold. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of a funny design in the doors on the side here, but we specifically put this door on the side of this model of, uh, of fridge because... We, uh, we really wanted to make a, make a fridge which fits in a really tight uh, frontage of bench space. So you can see here the fridge from left to right, so from this side to this side here, is basically 300 millimeter wide. Because we all know that you know, in a normal kitchen or entertainment area, that frontage space on your 600 millimeter deep bench, which is typically you know the bench dimensions, uh, is a real premium uh, bit of real estate. So I wanted to make sure that it was um, you know as efficient as possible on bench top bench top space. So it took up the full uh, width from front to back. So it's about 600 from the, the front surface to the back of the fridge here. It's six, 600 millimeters or 60 centimeters, um, and uh, still fitted these eight liter kegs in here now. The, you're probably looking at these going, hey, wait a second, what are these 8-litre kegs? They don't look like the 8-litre mini kegs that we've got because, uh, you know, a lot of you guys, if you've seen the stuff that we have, uh, you would be familiar with the 8-litre stainless steel mini kegs. So they look like this, right? And most of you guys probably know of this as a current mini keg where it takes a tapping head. And certainly these mini benchtop kegerators can take these if you want to use a stainless steel keg. However... We are also in the process of making some really cool mini kegs out of PT as well. Um, this is quite a involved product for us. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but we have our own blow molding plant in China. So I bought a blow molding machine uh, a couple of years ago. And um, we're in the process of doing a lot of upgrades on that blow molding uh, machine so we can make uh, a lot of these other small uh, blow molded kegs and stuff like that really efficiently. And the reason for that is because PT used in, is getting used more and more in, in the beer industry, um, but we felt that there were some areas in PET which we weren't happy with in the sense that PET does have a gas permeability to it. So if you get the, the bottle itself, um, you know, uh, basically you'll get... Uh, you know, oxygen can permeate through the 
through the PET wall itself, and then it degrades the beer. So PET, a lot of the PET used in the in the beer industry, it, it has really a limit on how long you can leave the beverage in there. And a lot of the, uh, the commercial industry will, try, will overcome a lot of issues with PET by using an oxygen scavenger in the wall of the PET bottle itself. So if you see a uh, PET plastic beer bottle, you know, most of the commercially used beer bottles, uh, which are made out of plastic, generally have an oxygen scavenger in the wall. Um, but uh, that's great for, you know, fast moving uh, consumable uh, products. But if you want to reuse a plastic container, like a homebrew plastic beer keg, for instance, um, you want to be able to uh, make sure that the oxygen scavenger doesn't deplete over time, which is exactly the issue which you get with uh, you know, most of the commercially available containers. So one of the ways to overcome that is to use multi-layer preform. So when you make a, a keg, and this is not really a super new technology, multi-layer preforms have been around for a long time, but they stopped getting used broadly by a lot of the packaging industry because they were much more complex to injection mold and made the process a bit more expensive. And it was just cheaper uh, to use an oxygen scavenger in the PET uh, you know, packaging itself. So uh, yeah, in order for us to be able to make you know, really good uh, you know, uh, PET kegs, which reduce the cost of somebody getting into a, a home keg set system, um, you know, we had to sort of also develop a preform, which was a multi-layer preform, which we can injection mold a multi-layer so we have similar oxygen barrier properties as a stainless steel keg has, uh, but at a much, much lower price point. So, um, you know, you'll see that uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this product here, we've got actually this new type of PET plastic uh, keg. Portly Gentleman is asking, uh, will the 8-litre keg model make it to the US? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for sure, these these particular um, you know eight liter kegs, these definitely are going to be released in the states. Um, you know, I did mention these to the guys at More Beer, and they seem quite enthusiastic about these and the whole benchtop dispenser. We are noticing in America there is a bit of a trend as well for smaller batches. Um, you know, you got other devices like the Pico Brew and stuff like that. Where look, if you look historically, everyone was doing sort of like 20, 25 liter batches, uh, whether that was in Australia or the states. But we're seeing a lot of guys doing these smaller batches as well and half size batches. So the eight liter kegs really suit that well. Uh, the other nice thing about these plastic kegs is the price will be so low. Like in Australia, we'll probably release these at um, approximately four Australian dollars. So uh, that will work out to be like like 100 and uh, I think about 120 kroners. I hope that's correct. Maybe you guys can look up the price on uh, on the exchange rate or whatever. But um, but that means that a keg is so cheap. Um, uh, it's it's cheap enough that you can give to a friend, and that's one of the really nice things about having like small uh, plastic kegs like this. Is you can you know package up some of your beer and give it to a friend, and that's always been a real pain for myself. If whenever I make beer, I often make more than what I need, uh, just because you know it's the same amount of time once you start all grain brewing to make you know 30 liters and 60 liters, but. I don't always want to drink 60 litres of the same beer myself. So I, I'm always in a situation where I want to give some away, but you know, I hate having to package it up in bottles and stuff like that. And cans does make it a bit easier. You don't have to wash out a whole lot of bottles. Um, but uh, you know, it still is a little bit of a hassle if I have to always put it into small packaging sizes if I want to give the beer away. And I don't always want to give them a stainless steel keg because I'm not really sure if it's going to come back as much as you know, I've got good friends who I generally really trust I don't trust them enough to give them a stainless steel keg otherwise you know it might just uh, even though it might come back it will come back probably too slowly and then uh, you know I'll be out of uh, you know an extra keg out of my own home keg pool for a little bit too long so if I had uh, a four liter uh, oh, sorry, an eight liter um, you know plastic keg which only cost me four Australian dollars you know I can easily part with that and if it just doesn't come back no big deal the other person can use it, I'll probably buy like, you know, maybe a half a dozen of these and have them in rotation, use them when I reuse them when I can, but if they disappear or whatever, not, not a big deal either. Um, 
Yeah, so this is uh, something that is uh, on the horizon. This uses uh, some of our existing tooling as well. Like we've got our red carbonation caps here, so we'll reuse some of that tooling, so that reduces a little bit of the cost. It's not making a big difference. It's still quite expensive when you make a whole fridge. Um, the other thing is, I'll just I'll just make this part transparent as well. One thing we've managed to fit in this housing is a... Uh, oops, there we go. Yeah, one thing we've managed to fit in the housing um, is actually an air pump as well. So I've sort of, I've made a lot of the parts disappear there. But we've actually got a little diaphragm air pump in here too. And this won't necessarily be in, in every single one that we sell, but we'll have different options. So you can buy the one without an air pump or with an air pump. And the reason we wanted to do that is because um, you know, we've got a lot of uh, beer dispensing gear out there, which you, which uh, is uh, structured around uh, nitro beers. And nitro is really popular. And look, I love nitro. I love uh, nitro coffee and uh, nitro cold brew co coffee and nitro beers and having a real Guinness poured off tap with that real creamy effect. You know, it's really hard to beat. I, I generally think... Uh, nitro is an area which will require a lot more development moving forward. And up until now, a lot of the nitro systems, uh, they've required us to um, use a nitrogen cylinder, which is kind of, which is either one we have to pay rental on, and it's another, you know, cylinder we have to own at home, and that's kind of annoying. And then the other problem is uh, with nitro, um, you know, if you don't have a, re a refillable cylinder, you've got a disposable cylinder, and that adds a lot of cost. So, you know, uh, either way, you know, the rental is a lot of cost or the, you know, disposable nitrogen cylinders are a lot of cost. So, uh, yeah, we're doing a lot of work at the moment um, on uh, using nitro, sucking the nitrogen out of the air and actually forcing that into the uh, into the beverage just right at the point of dispense. So the you know y there is oxygen exposure when you suck nitrogen out of the air, but if it's only getting exposed to that particular part of the product that you're dispensing, then obviously you don't have the problem of oxygen, which obviously oxygen takes a while to oxidize. Uh, you know the fatty acids and malts in beer and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, so we wanted to make sure we could fit a, a suitable diaphragm pump in here that the fridge eventually will be able to also do nitro dispensing and not need, um, you know, not necessarily need uh, a nitrogen gas cylinder if you didn't want to. So that's sort of one of the things that we're also trying to overcome and, uh, you know, do in this new 8-litre keg design. Maybe if this is successful, we might actually have these uh, pumps uh, inside some of the larger keg fridges as well later down the track. Um, yeah, oh, I've got another question here from Kenneth Sunby as well. Uh, yeah, thanks for shooting that across, David. Yeah, so uh, Kenneth was just asking, will smaller firm zillas be available for small batch brewing also? So uh, yeah, that's definitely something that uh, you know we've thought about. We've got a few uh, questions uh, on that one before and other people requesting the same thing. So yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, Firmzilla's uh, an area which we're heavily involved in. We've done a lot of development work. We continue to develop and improve the product. We've got uh, other attachments on top, which we're working on too. Um, I wasn't going to talk about uh, some of these attachments, but since I've got them not too far away, like we've got... Uh, this new ball valve, for instance, uh, this is something that just we started playing around the office. It may, it probably the finished product will look similar to this, but you know, for Firmzilla's, there's a lot of stuff we're making. Um, uh, like this is a dry hopping attachment, so it's a stainless steel ball valve, which you can get a plastic PET Coke bottle, fill it with hops, jam it on here. And actually, I think we actually put this on our website recently because we got the first batch of stock of these. Uh, yeah, we did actually. These actually, oh, they arrived today. Um, yeah, so let me show you this product. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, this is a ball valve here which fits onto uh, the top of the Firmzilla. So you can fill like a plastic bottle with hops. This enables you to purge the hops out really well um, and then drop them in from above. Previously, a lot of people had been using the collection container, but with large... Um, you know, amounts of hops, sometimes that could block up in the ball valve, even though I've got a large diameter. If you use enough hops, you can eventually block that as well. So some people wanted to be able to drop the hops in from above 
and uh, this uh, sort of worked well for that. So you could have the ball valve on top, you know, open this up, give the bottle a little bit of a shake like that, and the hops would flow down through the neck of that Coke bottle into the Firmzilla. So that's something that's coming out. So a lot of we do have a lot of uh, Firmzilla updates and um, you know accessories in the pipeline, uh, and definitely a smaller one is it's still being discussed. I wouldn't say it's got the approval amongst our design team yet, but look, I, I got a funny feeling that it, it's something that might happen uh, at some time next year. Um, so yeah, don't be surprised if uh, if Firmzilla's uh, do have, if there's like a new 10 litre, uh, you know, uh, or 12 litre or 15 litre Firmzilla, something like that coming out next year. Uh, we have been doing actually on Firmzilla's a lot of work with also um, uh, the uh, heat resistant tanks of Firmzilla's as well. Like some people have wanted to uh, pour boiling hot wort into the Firmzilla. Uh, so I've started to use another high temperature grade of, um, of polyester. Uh, so you can actually get boiling hot wort poured in there. Uh, we've actually started stuffing around with things like actually boiling in the tank itself. So look, I don't know if that ever will take off. It could could do, but it means that maybe you could fit an element to the tank, boil in boil your wort inside the fermenter. So you got a well a completely sterile environment then, or very very close to sterile environment, and then you would chill in the fermenter and then you know ferment possibly. I don't know. Look, it's something that we're playing around at the moment. We're definitely doing a lot of experimentation in high temperature tanks as well. Um, so that's something that's uh, also also happening. And I think I've got another question here as well that's come across. Um, oh, any plans on providing the Nuka tap in brass? So I've got that from, oh, it's a tricky one to pronounce. Yenigvar, Yenigvar, maybe? I'm not sure, anyway. But yeah, with the, uh, with the Nuka taps in brass, brass is something that, we have been looking to make uh, Nuka taps in copper, um, not brass straight away. You've got to remember with brass, it is cheaper. Brass is a lot cheaper than uh, than stainless steel, and and with brass, uh, it's it's it does have a nice sort of rustic look about it. Um, but really, you know, one of the things I don't really love about brass is all brass contains some degree of lead. It, it must, uh, and because we use a lot of acid-based uh, ingredients and, you know, more, more and more, more and more we're using acid-based uh, beverages as well. Like even look at the um, amount of sour beers that are available these days. And some of those beers are, have got that much lactic in there or that much acidic in there. They're really quite acidic where they can quite easily uh, start to take the surface of uh, oxidized brass off the brass and dissolve the brass. So when you get to a situation like that, um, really, you know, I, 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 I just don't love brass because you know essentially when you start dissolving the surface of brass you're essentially drinking the lead and even though there is such thing as lead free brass there's no such thing as lead free brass technically all brass even lead free brass contains lead so yeah it's something i don't really love and then also it affects the reliability of the tap as well if you've got essentially the taps dissolving when you're using these acid based cleaners and stuff like that so it's something that you know we we wouldn't really, uh, we've, we've really gone away from brass taps altogether. Like in the Nuka taps, we don't have any brass, uh, you know, chrome plated brass, for instance, at all. And I don't think we're, we ever will. It's now getting so similar, the cost between stainless and brass to manufacture for us, because um, of the volumes of stainless steel that we do, it's sort of, you know, it, it, it's not really worth it. Um, in my opinion, maybe we might have a brass look where we use a stainless steel tap body, but we just coat the outside. Potentially that'll happen. And that's what we're doing with copper. Uh, we have had some people also, because of the whole coronavirus uh, thing, be requesting copper taps a bit more, because obviously copper has some antimicrobial benefits. So we might, might eventually actually have some taps where the the whole tap body and spout and even some new tap handles, which are made in a copper a copper plate uh, but even that you know if you use too many acids will eventually you know corrode the the plating on the surface so it, it will wear out eventually and then you'll have to replace your taps or re copper plate them um, but yeah thanks for that question there um, yeah another question here is is the brewing machine on its way is there a new brewing machine on its way yeah we do have a new brewing machine on its way I uh, 
I've, I was specifically given the brief not to talk too much about the Bruzilla Generation 4. But yeah, there is a Bruzilla Generation 4 on the way next year, which will log up to the wrapped portal as well. So uh, it means what you've got to do is put in all that recipe, brew, have your brew day and stuff like that, and then it'll log all that, uh, uh, log your MASH profile up back onto the internet, so then you can refer back to it later. Um, you know, definitely as a home brewer myself, I'm pretty lazy of taking notes and sometimes, look, I forget. And, uh, you know, sometimes I make these absolutely cracking beers and I'm like, oh, how good was that beer? I just can't remember how to make it because I can't remember exactly what was that mash profile or whatever. And, you know, yeah, definitely the new Brazilers um, will be available with all those logging features as well. So then you can go back and see exactly, um, you know, how you made that beer and, um, you can also attribute certain ingredients to the recipe and, and, and store that on the wrap portal as well eventually. Oh, I've got another question here. Will the 8 litre kegerator and Grand Deluxe Ball make it to the US? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, definitely. To be honest with you, the Grand Deluxes, I think actually, I believe in the America, the Grand Deluxes might already, I'm pretty sure they are available through more beer already. And the 8 litre benchtop kegerator, Definitely next year. Um, so, yeah, it is a it is a long process. We are only like the 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 drawings that I was showing you just on the screen there a moment ago. They're drawings which are just very much pre preliminary drawings. I think probably we'll keep working on a lot of the designs. Uh, we'll probably start making some prototypes early next year, and then probably by about mid next year, all the designs will be settled. And then by the end of next year, I think it's quite likely we'll have the 8-litre keg dispenser available uh, for you guys in Europe, uh, but also you guys over in the States as well, hopefully if everything goes well. It's always a bit hard to know. Like we try to give you guys these best sort of uh, predictions of when products are going get, to get released. But we have definitely a lot of assumptions along the way there with, for instance, things like... Um, uh, you know, electrical compliance. So a lot of the electrical compliance when you make a new device, uh, you know, we'll have to go back and send it to the authorities to get checked out and they, you know, um, check out the processor in there and make sure it meets all the electromagnetic interference, uh, you know, testing, and then they have to go and you know, make sure it's electri electrically safe and whatever. And if they find any problems, we sometimes have to go back and then redesign parts. And that sort of loop can sometimes take a while, um, you know, to get product to market. But look, if everything goes well, I think I'd be I'd be disappointed if we can't get a eight liter bench top keg dispenser to the market by, uh, you know, towards the end of next year. Um, yeah, oh, people are asking for info on the hop missile as well. It's another question that just came through. Uh, so I'll just have a look at that one as well. Uh, this is a product. Look, if one of the other guys were here, I'd probably refer this question off to one of the other guys because this is a product I've used a little bit, but not a lot myself. Um, it's kind of funny. I actually have quite a different uh, brewing method to a lot of you guys, uh, I suppose. So, yeah, I I actually do the majority of my hopping in the brewing process. I add into what's called a, a cube or a plastic container. So, uh, yeah, this hop missile is a product which, you know, essentially is... Look, it's very similar to some other ones uh, out there. Um, and yeah, you just drop the hops in here. It's particularly designed for flower hops. Um, uh, but where people are using this, they're often using it um, uh, right at the end of a boil. Um, and then they're running their hot, uh, hot, their hot wort through this and then infusing the hops into their wort. So it's a really handy uh, product for infusing uh, large amount, extracting large amounts of hop oils right at the end of the brewing process. And because the wort's flowing all the way through the hop, you get like quite good extraction, which is why people are using this device. Um, the question was a bit open-ended though. It didn't sort of have the unique part of the question which you're looking for an answer for, but just, uh, you know, what it's what it's like and stuff like that. So um, yeah, it, it's definitely a, a fairly popular product. But once again, I don't use this much myself because I actually use cubes. So, um, yeah, I have done a few videos where you've seen me filling up a cube, and this is something that Americans don't really like. I'm not even sure if this is happening much in Europe either. I think it might be Australian invention, but instead of cooling beer, uh, cooling hot wort down 
um, in the uh, you know in the in the in the Brazilla itself or in your single vessel brewery if you're using a different brand or whatever. Um, instead of brewing brewing it and boiling it and then chilling it in there before you transfer it to a fermenter, um, a lot of guys in Australia like myself just put the hot wort directly into one of these plastic cubes. We squeeze the air out and then do the cap up. Now this is just a HDP plastic cube and a lot of people uh, have been doing this uh, up until now and what you can do is you can drop hops directly in here. So you've got literally boiling hot wort entering this plastic cube. Oh sorry I wasn't sharing screen then. Uh, yeah sorry about that. Yeah so I've got these boiling hot uh, wort and putting it into these plastic uh, cubes like just a big plastic drum screw the top on and let it cool down naturally over time. So in Australia where it's a hot country uh, and our ambient water temperature is quite warm. Look, we don't have the luxury in Norway of you guys probably have, you know, a tap water coming out of your tap at close to zero degrees. So it's easy for you guys to chill down really fast. But also for people who want to save water, uh, this is a really good method too. The only thing is if you are using this method of chilling wort in a cube, it often takes a while to cool down. So you just have to factor that into your recipe. So hops that I put into this plastic container and put the wort into, um, I have to basically um, factor in a 20 minute hop addition. So the hops that I put in essentially, they're not, the zero minute hops are 20 minute hops essentially. Um, yeah, so I just factor that into my recipe. And I've done recipes where I actually don't add any hops in the boil at all. And I've put the entire lot of hops in the cube. So literally boiled the wort, don't add any hops, chuck the whole lot of wort in the cube and then just sit it in the corner of the garage and it cools down for let's say a week or whatever. And then when I'm ready to ferment, I can just tip that into the fermenter. And it means that I can have my um, uh, brew days on days which I don't necessarily have to start the fermentation process as well. It's one kind of nice thing about this. So I can actually do multiple, multiple beer brews in a day, stock up a bit of wort essentially, put it into cubes and have cubes stacked up on the shelf. And then uh, what I can do is just ferment them when I've got time. And, uh, you know, I feel from a from a time perspective, it really is just a big time saver for me. So that's probably one of the main major reasons uh, we do that. Another thing we should say, though, on this topic is we actually also started to manufacture bladders as well, like this, which are hot fill bladders. So some people who don't have the storage space for, because these, once you start doing, you know, uh, several beers at a time, and if you're doing like, I actually do 60, 50, 60 litre brews uh, generally. Um, you know, I've got these empty plastic containers take up a lot of space. So I've actually started now to do hot fill uh, bladders. So it's kind of like a wine bladder, or in Australia they call them goon sacks. But um, uh, yeah, these also are something you can fill up hot with hot wort and let it cool down naturally. So maybe if you're in Norway, you can just fill the bladder and just chuck the whole bladder probably out on the snow, I guess. I don't know, like if it's in, if it's in, uh, if it's in winter. Um, yeah, so that's sort of another thing. Actually, I should also say that we've got bladders which are for uh, fitting to kegs too. This is another, I actually didn't really intend to speak about this, but because, um, uh, because I've already got you guys in the conversation about bladders, uh, we've actually made, started to make keg lids. This is another sort of sample which I've been playing around with. But as you can see, it's a funny keg lid where it's got a post on the top here and it's got a th female thread on the underside here. And that's because also you can screw it. Now, it's not this bladder. We've got a different bladder design for this application. But we're also in the process of making new bladders to fit to keg lids like this. So you can actually drop the uh, bladder into like a corny keg, for instance, and that way you can dispense the corny keg with, you know, something like compressed air. So this is particularly handy if, let's say, you are into home wine making, but you don't want to have to bottle all that wine. You can actually dispense it from a keg, and traditionally you would need to then go and buy argon, and argon's kind of an expensive gas. It's very it's starting to become, uh, you know, harder and harder to get. I think the price of argon has increased quite a lot recently. Um, well, for us in Australia, I don't know what like it's you like overseas, but yeah. Um, but it's it's one of these things which uh, you could put into a keg, 
like that. Dispense it with compressed air, or you could use CO2 for that matter. And then you could use the bladder for things like nitro as well. So that, that way is another way of avoiding uh, to use a uh, nitrogen gas cylinder. So that's something we're doing a bit of research on at the moment. Uh, bladders in corny kegs. This is actually quite a simple product. So to be honest with the bladders and the corny keg lids to take bladders, I think these will probably be available quite soon. Uh, I think even before the end of this year, it's quite likely that these sort of come out in Australia. Uh, we'll get a bit of a feel for the market in Australia and if they're successful in Australia, yeah, the bladders and the keg lids and bladders and stuff like that will go over to, to Europe as well and you'll probably see them too. Um, looks like I've got another question here. Finding it hard to keep up with these questions, guys. Um, uh, are you going to move the controls of the bit? Yes, uh, that is one thing that we are doing. Uh, so, yeah, we've got a question here from Daniel. Are you going to move the controls for the Bruzilla Generation 4 to the top of the machine? And yes, absolutely, that has uh, been one of the major, major complaints, I guess. With the Brazilers, look, they're a great unit, they're a fantastically priced unit, and they've been popular all around the world, but, you know, for the the, 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 the feedback that we get from, you know, the whole community of people uh, that are using those, is they'd like to see the controller a bit higher, because, um, yeah, let me... I think I might be actually able to pull up some CAD... I think I can show you this. I, I wasn't going to show the CAD of this product, so I did, didn't queue this up. So I've got to find it on my computer. Bear with me one second. Um, uh, uh, one second. Oh, I don't have it on this computer, actually. Oh, no, no, don't have it on this computer. That's okay. We can we can cover that next time. Uh, look, uh, you will have more information for that soon. But yeah, definitely uh, the Bruzilla controller will move up right to the side of the controller and also be detachable. Some people were also requesting that too because, um, you know, if you're wanting to hose the whole unit down, um, it does make it a lot easier to wash if you can actually take the controller off the side of the brewery. So, and then it's also on a little bracket on the side of the brewery, which you can tilt up and down on the side of the brewery. So yeah, definitely the Brazil Generation 4s will have that feature involved. And it'll have a few other uh, cool features as well. So the underside will actually be an open cavity, so you can more easily get to the pump for things like maintenance and stuff like that as well. And uh, yeah, there's a few other cool things. But uh, that's something I'll probably save uh, a little bit for uh, the, uh, the next live, uh, live crossover, I guess. Yeah, with the mini keg stuff, yeah, I sort of got halfway uh, uh, into that and sort of stopped. Yeah, we're also manufacturing a lot of other stuff related to mini keg systems. So we, just like the 8-litre benchtop keg dispenser, um, you know, we're trying to make everything more compact as well. So uh, it suits these people who, you know, want to have mini keg systems. And uh, one of the things that we've sold a lot of in Australia are these... Um, these duo tight uh, mini regulators. So this is a very, very compact uh, regulator. Um, and this is one that, look, you still need a primary regulator, but uh, historically, if you had a multi pressure gas system, you would have to use a very bulky regulator. Uh, if you wanted to run, let's say, one pressure for one beer type and another pressure for another. Uh, beer type. Uh, so you'd have to use one of these bad boys. And these were very bulky, took up a lot of space, and they kind of tend to topple over sideways because they're so so heavy and they sort of can counterweight the, they can sort of be heavy enough to, to make your CO2 gas cylinder want to fall over sideways. And that often leads to smashing one of your gauges, which is pretty annoying. Yeah, but also once you get into, say, systems where you've got three or four pressures available, so let's say you've got, I don't know, an English ale, a wheat beer, and then I'm doing a nitro or something like that, um, the need to have multi-pressure systems becomes more and more necessary, uh, which is why we made these mini regulators. And really, it's the first sort of regulator of this sort of size ever made, where it has the gauge built into the you know diaphragm mechanism, and the gas runs through. So this is something that uh, you know we also have gas boards as well. So you can buy the um, the plastic board here, a polypropylene board which these mini regulators mount to. Uh, so you can have the different pressures and so forth. And this can make a really, really neat setup, um, you know, for multi-keg uh, dispensing systems. Another thing that we've also got is uh, the mini regulators as well. I know in Europe, you guys seem to use soda streams a lot more. Well, it seems to be a lot more than in other countries. 
uh, and it's one of the reasons why I made the Core 360 uh, regulator. Uh, so it's another mini sort of device uh, that we've got, and this comes out uh, really soon. Up until this particular regulator, which we uh, made, we we used to buy generic Chinese factory regulators, and we tried other European ones as well, and other American brands. We tried like a Leyland regulator, and that look wasn't too bad. It still had some problems with it. Um, and other Chinese ones, uh, which were cheaper. Yeah, but when we started manufacturing all these uh, mini regulators, um, yeah, we also uh, started to really want to redesign these regulators as well and make them a lot better. So the Core 360 is a new type of regulator, uh, which is designed to be uh, able to be easily used on things like soda stream cylinders. So you can see this on a soda stream cylinder here. I'm not sure if you guys have had this problem before, but if you use a lot of the soda stream adapters, you screw the soda stream cylinder into the regulator. And because the way the regulator is designed, when you're screwing that uh, soda stream uh, uh, bottle into the regulator, it pushes down on a pin. And momentarily, when you're screwing it in, it's gas is flowing out because it's pushing the pin down, but it hasn't yet sealed on the seal on the underside of the of the regulator. And that's like an amazingly frustrating thing for a lot of guys. Same thing with the 16 gram bulbs. Uh, you know, you know those disposable, disposable little CO2 chargers? Um, you know, you've only got like 16 grams. And then by the time you've screwed it in, it's punctured the, the little bulb. And then half the gas is leaked out. You're down to like eight grams. And it's barely enough to dispense like one liter of beer. So it's really frustrating. So we knew there was a need to make a new mini regulator for a lot of these mini keg systems and um, that's why we came out with this core 360 now this is already uh, sold out in australia uh, for the first batch we've got another shipment uh, which is uh, which came in and then sold out quickly i think we're actually maybe up to the third batch now of, and, and i think we just can't make these fast enough so i think these little core 360 uh, mini regulators will be really popular because they give you so much more control over that process. You can screw the soda stream bottle in, and then at your leisure, you can use the core depressing pin. So it's got a pin on the top hop, top here, which you screw down like that, and it pushes this actuator right in the middle down, um, and then that allows the gas to flow. It also means that you can turn the gas off just as easily. So some people who, for instance, might think they've got a gas leak or not 100% sure or just want to be, you know, extra cautious, you know, a traditional type of regulator would involve them to have to unscrew the whole bottle out. But once you remove this pin and screw this up, because that core is no longer depressing on a soda stream cylinder, then you've got absolutely no risk of any gas continuing to flow through either. But this is a massive, massive game changer, for, I think, for a lot of small portable keg systems. Um, yeah, I must say, one of the things, one of the constraints we have uh, found with this product, though, is the little gauges. Uh, these are 27 millimeter by 27 millimeter in size. That's like an inch by an inch, so very, very small uh, compact gauge on these types of things. And one of the constraints with uh, making a gauge so small with a um, capillary mechanism, because a lot of these, all these analog gauges, they've made very much in the same way, where they have a little capillary tube inside there, and the pressure that comes in basically expands a capillary tube, and that capillary tube expanding drives a little cog, and then that cog essentially is what drives the pressure gauge needle. So all those mechanical components, there are limitations on how accurately you can make them in such a small size. So another thing that we've been working on as well is digital gauges too. So it's another exciting product on the horizon. And just like the wrap bridge I was showing you, that already had a digital gauge uh, superimposed into the, into the product there. And that's one of the things that we're also doing at the moment. So I'll show you those two. Um, yeah, these will fit into yeah even the blow tie uh, units. Uh, so I know you guys use a lot of guys using uh, pressure fermentation. Uh, they use these blow tie uh, uh, blow tie spunding valves. Um, so ones that look like this here. So these blow tie spunding valves, this is the first one I searched on Google, looks like it's being sold on eBay. Um, but yeah, these will also take the mini gauges, these 27 millimeter uh, digital gauges that we're starting to make, 
they'll look like this and they'll fit a lot of the products that we sell. So um, yeah, let me just, uh, yeah, you can see it's got a small digital display here, but really easy to read. It's got a couple buttons on the front. So one to wake the product up and the other one to turn on the backlight, if you want a backlight. Uh, the other thing is, uh, yeah, it's got a, like a little battery tray here. This one takes a 2032 battery. Uh, so that's the lithium lithium uh, ion 2032. Uh, and based on checking the pressure um, uh, once a day, uh, this should be able to last uh, at least six months. Now, if you're checking the pressure less than once a day, probably it'll last a lot longer. And I think a lot of people probably, you know, they'd probably only check pressure once a week or something like that, in which case they should get years out of it. Um, but yeah. Uh, it was very, very hard to make it this compact. It's sort of hard to appreciate how small this is until you actually get it in your hand. But this mini gauge here, it's literally 27 by 27. And we wanted to keep this where it was flush with the um, surface of things like the mini regulator and uh, the Core 360 regulator. So I'll also do this. Yeah, so this is the mini... Uh, uh, gauge sitting in the mini regulator. So it's a mini digital gauge sitting in a mini regulator. So um, that is how it sits. And you can see the cavity space here is tiny. We only had like about uh, 20 millimeters or less than 20 millimeters to play. I think it was 17 millimeters or something like that to play with um, to fit the gauge into this uh, very, very small depth hole. Um, so that was something that was really, really hard to do. I think this is actually the most compact digital gauge that I've ever seen ever. Um, so, uh, yeah, it'll be really exciting to sort of, uh, get this one out into the market. We're also making these digital gauges also with the blue, uh, the duotite barb at the back. So where you can fit, uh, it onto duotite fittings in that way. Um, you know, if you guys make your own stuff, I know a lot of home brewers, they're also, you know, real hobbyists and they want to, you know, uh, do a lot of DIY jobs themselves or, um, you know, I used a whole lot of home brewing gear to make a, a, a water rocket for my daughter just on the weekend and, you know, using a lot of this sort of bits and pieces head lying around. I know what it's like. You're often using stuff to uh, for other sort of DIY uh, projects, I guess. So, yeah, when we have the duo type fitting on the back, uh, this will make a really, really easy compact gauge to use for other things which you can really easily and quickly plumb in because it has a duo type push-in barb uh, on there. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's another another really exciting product that's uh, sort of coming out. Um, I think I've got another. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I've got a question from Kim. Any plans for premium premium Brewzilla like the Brew Tools Brewing System? Um, there has been some discussion about having like the Brew Tools Brewing System uh, has like for those of you who don't know has a has a, um, a another valve on the side of it. Uh, which enables you to redirect the beer flow, like the wort flow. Uh, and some of those features, look, we've been considering it. It hasn't been decided. Uh, it does make the setup, uh, does make the plumbing a lot more complicated. And I think with complexity, it can bring sometimes just as many negatives as positives, I suppose. So, look, I, as much as, you know, the, the Brew Tools does have uh, a nice system uh, and a nice brewery, um, you know, I think it's one of those things that we're not 100% sold on whether, um, you know, the Brutal setup is, is um, really that necessary, I guess. So it's something we're still sort of, um, you know, we're umming and ahhing about. Uh, you know, by, by no stretch are we completely settled on the design for the new Brazilla Generation 4 yet. So look, the best thing is at the moment, if you've got any particular ideas or unique feature, features, please just shoot us an email and um, you know let us know what your thoughts are or if you happen to even write a sketch of uh, an idea you've got, we will generally, we will absolutely take that very, very seriously. Um, and uh, it's often how, as I was saying before, it's often how a lot of the new products we make here are, are made because of feedback from our customer base like yourself. So. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, if there's a particular aspect of the brew tools which you like, uh, which you want to send through, or another brewery for that matter, which you want to see in the Brazilas, uh, yeah, please just shoot that through. Um, 
Yeah, anyway, uh, look, it's getting pretty late, man. It's already 3.45. I've gone, like, way, way over time here. So, yeah, I think I should probably uh, uh, wrap the, the seminar or webinar up. If you've got any other questions, yeah, yeah definitely uh, shoot them through. Uh, if you want to keep uh, on top of all the new, st new, new stuff that we bring out, definitely subscribe to our, uh, our YouTube channel. So Kegland's got her own YouTube channel, which I put all the products uh, up there when we have new products come out. And uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, yeah, continue this conversation, you could always join our Kegland Facebook uh, homebrew, Kegland Homebrew Community Group. So that's another good place you can sort of discuss uh, a lot of the new products, a lot of our uh, other members as well. And of course, just shoot any uh, questions you've got through Olbringing as well. Uh, obviously, as um, our, our distributor, one of our major distributors in all of Europe, uh, Olbringing are doing a fantastic job uh, of uh, you know looking after all the customer service and uh, assisting with the gear. So yeah, shoot any questions to you know the crew at Olbringing too. Anyway, look, thanks for your time, guys. Look, it's been a real privilege to talk to you. I hope I haven't waffled on too much. I feel like this has gone way too long. But anyway, hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, we'll talk to you, uh, talk to you next time. All right. See you, guys. Bye.